welcome to MRCC Church Online. We're so yep. grateful and glad that you're here to join us today. How are you doing, Brent? Doing great. It's a, it's a blast to be doing this online stuff still. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just thrilled to be able to still be doing this. Right, it's such a great way to connect uh, from home. It so really we're is. Th so thankful that you're here, but we wanna make sure you do know that we want you to be a part of our church family. Yeah. Uh, online, in person, we're just so grateful that you're here. So if you're new, it's great if you would click the connect button. If you're on YouTube, just come to mrccnow.org so that we can connect with you and just know and be a part of the church family. And then of course, if you had any needs, we just wanna be able to reach out and help. So uh, you can definitely call the church office at any time uh, during the week. We're here and would just love to connect with you in a personal way. So yep. do that if you can. Yeah. It's good and, stuff. Uh, you know, of course, there's been lots of cool stuff going on. Lots right? of great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We, we already had last week a uh, band of brothers had their yep. golf tournament, right? Yep. I was not there. Um, I, well, I was there <laughs> and um, I was bad. So spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but the band of brothers golf tournament is super awesome. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, band of brothers, we are going to be having the kickoff here in the sanctuary on the 28th golf? at 630 PM. No, just re regular band of brothers. Okay. We'll gather here. Here. Um, we'll kind of have some good, well, yeah, golf, but more like mini golf. But we'll have some delicious dinner. We'll hang out as just a bunch of guys fellowshipping mm -hmm. together. It's going to be a blast. You're not going to want to miss that. You know, ladies don't want to miss out on that either. No, right? not at all. A good meal nope. together is always awesome. Yep. Uh, so we have our own thing, Sisters of Strength, and they'll be starting up, kicking off on October 5th. So they'll be here. We had right a really on. great event with them last week as well, last Friday, just a women's kickoff event, just to get to know all the groups that are meeting. So it's been pretty awesome, right? Very cool. Yeah, Very cool. Yeah. Uh, listen, wherever you're at right now, in your proximity, there's probably something that you could substitute in for some communion elements as we prepare to receive communion today, coffee. right now, wherever you're at. Uh, coffee. Maybe some, cake, maybe some cake, maybe some coffee cake. Um, you could grab a Pop-Tart, you could grab whatever is nearby that mm -hmm. you might be able to use to join us in observing what Jesus has done fun. for Throw us. in the chat, right? Oh yeah, let I mean, let us know what, us what you guys are using for your communion. We can get creative with it and it's just a fun way for us to celebrate that together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And just prepare our hearts for that time of communion, no matter what it is that you grab. Yep. Uh, we just want to be able to celebrate in communion together, but also in worship, right? We so want to worship, yep. Let's worship God, worship our Savior uh, together today. Thanks for being here. Amen. Yep. Hello, church. Thank you so much for joining us today, wherever you're at right now. Would you worship with us as we lift up our God in all of his goodness? Sing, he's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him sing so open up the gates Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the 
Church, let's continue to worship our Savior this morning.
I'll build my life And I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you covers all, Lord. Let's continue to worship him together. Standing here in your presence in a great so relentless I am one by perfect love wrapped within the arms of heaven in a peace that lasts forever sinking deep in mercy seen. and I'm wide awake drawing closer by grace and all oh, my heart is yours all fear removed, I breathe you in, I lean into your love, oh, your love, yes, Jesus, it's your love, when I'm lost, Pursue me, lift my head to see your glory, Lord of love, so beautiful. Here in you I find shelter, captivated by the splendor of your face, my secret place, and I'm wise. Sing your love so deep. Your love 
so deep is washing over me Your face is all I see You are my everything Jesus Christ, you are my one desire Lord, hear my only cry To know you all my life Church, we worship Jesus because of his love for us. Psalm 29 verse 2 says this, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. We worship a God whose very name invokes praise, whose very actions that are in our lives every day deserve all of our love in all of our adoration. Let's continue to pour out praise to him this morning as we worship.
grab those elements that you prepared earlier as we prepare to receive communion together. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive this. In the same way, after he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's receive this. And it goes on to say, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, let's proclaim how great our Lord is one last time. You are good, good, Father, we thank you that you are so good to us, Lord, and we proclaim praises to you wherever we are, God, in this place right now. We worship you. Lord, you are great. You love us, and we love you. Amen. Oh, yes, Lord, you are good. We rejoice in that. We confess that. We celebrate that, Lord. Even when we don't understand how your goodness is happening in our lives, we have learned to trust who you are even more than what we see. And so we worship you this morning, and we thank you, and we, we confess that you are good, God, and good to us. Well, it's great. It's great to be with you, friends. It's great to worship with you. It's great to be gathered in spirit with you. Uh, I just want you to know, we want you to know that those of us who are participating online in this season, those of us who meet in person, our hearts are with you every time. We pray together for you and with you. We're thinking of you. Uh, we are still one united church, even in this season. And we look forward to when we're able to put this behind us and, and be together in, in body as well as in spirit. But uh, just know uh, that our hearts are for you during this season. It is great to be with you. Thank you, Pastor Weston and the worship team for leading us. You know, the reality, church, is that the Bible says your ability, my ability to think clearly in life depends on our giving glory to God, on our worshiping Him. That's what resets our thinking and our perspective and our reasoning. So know that when you discipline yourself to worship, what you're really doing is giving yourself the blessing of a clear head and heart. And uh, God gives that when we worship. So. This morning, we are going to uh, open Matthew's Gospel to chapter 24, and I want to invite you to, to turn there right now. And as you're doing that, you know, this is a special Sunday morning in kind of our, our annual calendar, our yearly calendar, because on this particular morning, we pause to pray specifically for those of us who are serving in our schools. Uh, whether as teachers or administrators or servants in some other form, you are on our hearts this morning and during this season. And every year as a church, we say the same thing to you. One is that we want to pray for you. We're going to do that in just a moment. And the second thing is, uh, and maybe we want to say this more clearly than ever before, given everything that's going on, as you enter into your ministry in our public schools, know this, we as a church stand behind you not only in prayer, but tangibly, if you as ministers in our schools come across issues, situations where we as a church can tangibly support you, maybe you need something for your classroom, maybe you know a student that's needy that needs some supplies or some equipment for their school, or, or maybe there's some special unique situation that the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart, please, we want you to know as we pray for you this morning, that you can come to your church, that we are a family standing with you in your ministry and share that need with you. And very often, 
when those needs are shared, we are able as a church to help. That's why we all give, so that we can do things like that. So please, teachers, administrators, school servants of all uh, stripes, please know that our hearts, your church's heart is open to you in this season. And, and we want to stand with you as you serve God in the schools. Um, and right now, we want to pray for you as you enter into this very unusual school year. We want to ask God's blessing on what you're doing. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we thank you for the calling that you have given to our teachers, our administrators, our school servants, God. We know that that is a supernatural calling, that you have strategically placed them among our children. And you've taught us, Lord, that our children are the most important people in our world. And so, God, we ask your blessing on all those who are serving in our public schools. We pray that you would fill them with strength, with insight, with wisdom, with patience, God, with love for the kids that come into their classroom. God, we ask your blessing on them. Make them fruitful this year. Help them to see the difference they're making. And God, we also pray that as you lead them and they see those, those, those spaces in, in their lives or in other people's lives where we as a church can partner with them, help them to discern that and to share that with their church so that together we can do your will. We pray for that, God. We ask your blessing on all of us who serve in our schools. And we pray it this morning in Jesus' name. Yeah, we're thinking about you in this time. We are praying for you and we appreciate you. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, if you'll turn there this morning, let's enter God's Word together. And, and let me begin by, by asking you this. Have you ever asked a really dumb question? <laughs> I know I have more than once. Uh, some would say I'm particularly gifted at asking dumb questions. Let, let me give you an example. You know, my, my wife is cleaning the house and getting prepared for people to come over. And I come downstairs and I see her doing that. And I say, hey, do you want me to help you with that? That's a dumb question. <laughs> Why would I even ask? Of course she wants me to help her with that. I remember one time when we got out of church, when our son Isaiah was very small, a toddler, we got in the car. It was a glorious summer day. We'd had a wonderful time of fellowship and worship. And we got in the car afterwards and we turned to Isaiah and, and we said, hey, son, do you think we should stop for ice cream on the way home? What a dumb question to ask a toddler. It kind of became a legend in our family because he looked at us. He must have been about four. He looked at us and said, duh. <laughs> in other words, dad, that's a dumb question. No, I'm not the only one who asks dumb questions. A friend of mine in Bible college turned to me once in class and said, Hey, Greg, do you think, do you think Jesus had any older brothers? <laughs> we laughed. Ever heard of the virgin birth? I said to my buddy. <laughs> Ever heard of that part of the gospel story? Everybody asks dumb questions sometimes. It's just the human nature. What's really a problem is when we fall into the habit of asking the wrong questions. Will Rogers said famously that smart folks are just the ones who've learned to ask the right questions. And that is profoundly true. Bertrand Russell said, science asks the wrong question when it wonders how a bird sings. The right question is, why is it beautiful? There's a world of difference between asking the wrong questions and asking the right questions. And when we learn to ask the right ones, we learn. And God wants to talk to us about that this morning because in the same way, a lot of people today are asking, are we living in the end times with everything that's going on in our world? Are we living in the last days? Are we living in the tribulation? Technically speaking, we've been living in the last days since, since Jesus was resurrected. But the question is really the wrong question. The right one is, how does God want me to live in today, regardless of what time it is on God's calendar? You know, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked that same question that's on so many hearts today. They asked, hey, when are the last days going to culminate? When is the end times coming? And he answered by making it clear that the question when is the wrong question. 
The right question is why and what and how are we to live in this season? And he wants to do the same thing with you and me in this season of turmoil. He wants to help us see what the right question is because the right question makes all the difference. You know, Pastor Weston and Stacy have been asking themselves over and over these last couple of weeks about when the baby will come. Matter of fact, we're, we're recording this midweek. By the time you're hearing it on Sunday or whenever you hear it, their baby may have already come. We're expecting her any day. Those of us who are parents, we understand the when, when, when question that they are urgently asking. But we also know how insignificant that question really is. Because when the baby comes, they will forget all their when questions. And it will all be about that moment that came way faster than they thought it would. All the when questions will be completely forgotten when the baby arrives. So it is with us in the end times. I've invited you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Let's listen to Jesus and watch him in this moment with the disciples as they ask the kinds of questions that are on many of our hearts today. The scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 4 beginning with verse 1 this. The Bible says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call attention to its building. So Jesus and the disciples are in Jerusalem. He often taught in the temple courts, in the temple at the center of the city. And, and they're leaving the temple after a, a time of, of teaching. And the disciples uh, called his attention to its buildings. We'll talk about why in a moment. Jesus responded to them by saying, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now, now, to understand what he's saying, let's pause for a moment and, and realize that, that that temple that the disciples and Jesus were walking away from was the centerpiece of Jerusalem, was the spiritual center place of the whole Jewish nation in that time and place. It was one of the wonders of the world. It was plated in gold. It was visible for miles as you approached Jerusalem on a sunny day. The sun would reflect off all that gold and it would just be uh, like, a, like a star on the the horizon. And at night they would light it up with candles and candelabras and they would glow off of the metal and create kind of an, uh, an imitation of the glory of God that descended on the first temple. The temple at the center of Jerusalem was thought of as the, the foundation in many ways of, of Jewish spiritual life and of Israeli national pride. And when the disciples asked Jesus about it, they were kind of celebrating that. And Jesus responded in a way they would have never anticipated. He said, fellas, not one stone here will be left on another. This whole place will be torn down. This whole place is far less significant than you think it is. Now, it's important to understand that because in the same way, we often fall into the trap of thinking that the things we see in our world are more important than the things we don't. But Jesus is always calling our attention to what lies beyond this world. Because you and my, me are only here temporarily. And what God is doing has more to do with what lies beyond this world than what lies in it. We forget that eternity for every one of us is just one heartbeat away. But when we remember that, it redefines everything. I remember when I was a teenager and, and sometimes Friday would come, the end of the school week, and my friends and I would be so excited that Friday had come and we had the weekend laying out in front of us that we would get together and hang out. And sometimes, you know, in our exuberance, we would just stay up all night. <laughs> hang out together and stay up all night thinking, the weekend's here, this is awesome, we got the whole weekend ahead of us. Well, what inevitably happened every time we did that was by Saturday morning, we were so exhausted and fried that we slept most of the day and it took us till Monday to recover again. We lost touch with the fact that the weekend could be enjoyed much more if we had received it differently. And Jesus wants to make a change like that in our understanding here in this moment. You know, after being shocked by what Jesus had said, the Bible says that the disciples came to him and they asked questions about what he had said. Verse 3 tells you exactly what they asked. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. 
tell us, they said, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They recognized that Jesus was talking about the end of the age and his return and the ushering in of God's kingdom and its fullness. And they came to him and said, okay, when are these things going to happen? Lord, we want to know when. Look at verse 3, and you can hear the emphasis on when. When will these things happen? And lots of people are asking that same question today. We're, we're kind of like kids in the backseat of the car saying, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? When? 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 You know, the adults in the car in those moments, we understand that the long wait will be forgotten when we arrive at where we're going, Disneyland or the beach or the lake or Grandma's house or whatever. And Jesus' answer to the disciples' question about when steers them back to what really matters. Look at verse, verse 4. He said to them first, he said, watch out that no one deceives you. That's his first response to their question about when. Why? Because when we're in a hurry, we're tempted to sacrifice the truth for shortcuts. We're tempted to look for quick answers, for one-liners, for slogans, for campaign speeches, instead of the hard, real work of the truth and reality. And we become susceptible to deceptions. That's why Jesus says, watch out that no one deceives you. We become susceptible to deceptions when we start always looking for shortcuts to our marriages or our parenting or our faith. Jesus wants us to understand there aren't shortcuts. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 46, verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. Your ability to hear what I'm saying to you and to receive it depends on your being unhurried and on your paying attention to me. You know, I, I kind of fall into this trap every time I, I bring home a, a home-baked pizza. You know, usually in, in my hurry to get to it because I bought it because I'm hungry, I just tear the wrapping off and throw it in there and ignore the instructions and figure if I cook it at some temperature for a certain amount of time, it's going to come out fine. It never does. <laughs> it's burned on the outside, soft on the inside. And in the end, sometimes I end up throwing it away and eating something else. And the whole thing was caused by my being in a hurry and allowing myself to be deceived about how things work. And Jesus knows this. He knows that when we're hurried, when we're in a rush, when we're all focused on when, other people can take advantage of us, and they will. Look at verses 5 and following. Jesus says in verse 4, watch out that no one deceives you. And then he says, for many will come in my name, claiming I'm the Christ, and they'll deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of war. See to it that you are not alarmed. That's important. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be turmoil. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. The prophets speak of plagues, what we would call pandemics. All these, though, Jesus says, using a, a pithy and powerful word picture, all of these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, anybody who's been around a woman in labor knows that the beginning of birth pains is very different from the middle or the end. The beginning of birth pains doesn't signal that the baby's about to arrive. It signals that, okay, at some point the baby's going to come. And Jesus makes that distinction here. Notice what he says to them and to us when they ask the when question, given what they were seeing in the world around them. Jesus says, see to it that you are not alarmed. Friends, that's a word to us as believers in this time and season. We are not meant to be alarmed, panicked, ridden with anxiety. Jesus, in fact, says, see to it that you don't let that happen to you. How do you do that? He's going to explain in just a moment. What he's saying is don't, don't let yourself get freaked out, get uptight, get worried. Crazy stuff will come, the Lord says. But don't let it panic you to the point that you start listening to deceivers. And that's happening to a lot of people. We turn on the internet, start listening to people carrying on about their imaginary fantasy predictions about what's next, and we get caught up in it. Jesus says, don't. See to it that you are not alarmed. Don't pay so much attention to the wrong questions that you curl up on your couch and start sucking your thumb. Lots of people believe that today we are living in unprecedented times. They say to themselves, well, this has never happened before. But can I tell you, that's only because they don't know what has happened before. 
If you know history at all, you realize that the things that are happening today are not unprecedented. It's the, even the attitudes, the turmoil in our society, the struggles in our environment, these kinds of things have happened before. And all it takes is a little effort to find that out. You know, as kind of an amateur history buff, me and some of my nerd friends, uh, we have a saying, and the saying, the first part of it you recognize, the second part of it is kind of just for us. And the first part of it says this, uh, those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. You probably heard that before. Well, we kind of add a second part to that so that it sounds like this. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Those who do are doomed to sit around and watch everybody else repeat it. <laughs> because they don't understand that, yeah, these things have happened before. Jesus wants us to understand that the things we're seeing are the beginning of birth pains, not the end. In other words, there's lots of pain and discomfort before the baby comes. But let's not assume that all pain and discomfort mean the baby is imminent. Uh, uh, imminent. Jesus is careful in this moment to teach his friends how we should think about the turmoil and strife we see in the world. And, and he's going to drive that point home even more strongly in the next verse. Look at verses 9 and following. Jesus says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. In other words, he says, tough times will come. But his real concern and the thing he wants to keep us from is what he says next. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Friends, that's happening around us. Because of the increase of wickedness, Jesus says, revealing his heart for the way they were seeing the, these end times events that they were asking about and he would teach them about. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end, he who is not alarmed, he who is not panicked, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Again, in these times in which we live, many people are so consumed by the when question that they run off chasing every knuckle-headed false prophet selling a song and dance about the end times. I've been watching this happen my whole life. But Jesus is going to sum up the when question in verse 36 when he's going to say this, no one knows the day or the hour of his return, of the end of the age. No one knows it, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son but only the Father. In other words, don't keep asking when, because that's not the point. And it's not given to us to know. You know, sometimes our desire to know when is really a, a manifestation of our sinful nature. It's kind of like going to the eye doctor and memorizing the eye chart so that you can give the right answer and pretend you're not blind. You know, that's a road to nowhere. And the question when, Jesus says, is not the right question in this season. He, he gets to the real issue that he's more concerned about how these things might affect our connection to the Father than exactly when they will happen. And that's what he's saying in verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will go cold. I wonder if, if you're tempted to feel that in this season. I know many are because I've heard from them. They read the news, they watch what's happening in our culture, in our environment, in our society, and they feel as if their love is growing cold. And the reason that's happening is because they become so consumed with those things that they've forgotten to listen to the Lord of those things. You see, the right question isn't when stuff will happen, because it will happen in God's perfect time. The real question is whether I will let it interfere with my trust in and my obedience to my Father in the meantime. Or even more pointedly, with my love for Him and my love for my fellow believer and my love for my enemy in the meantime. Anxiety can turn us against each other. An obsession with the winds can turn us against each other. That's why Jesus warned at that time many will turn away from the faith, will betray and hate each other. It can distract us so completely that we turn away from our faith itself. Jesus said many will fall away from the faith. And worst of all, worst of all, it can make our love grow cold. If you've ever experienced a cold love, you know what an awful thing it is. 
Ask a wife whose husband has become so consumed by his career or his hobbies or his hang-ups that he has stopped pursuing her. And she'll tell you about the pain in her heart. Ask a teenager whose parents have let the normal struggles of adolescence cause them to check out on patiently enduring with their son or daughter. And they'll tell you how awful a cold love is. Or ask the God who loves you and me so much that he would send his own son to die on a cross and pay the price for our sins just so that we would know his love and we would give him our love. A cold love to him is a terrible thing. Dear friends, Jesus in this moment steers his friends away from making the main, uh, the when question, the main question. Because he knows that our love for him and for one another depends on our being less obsessed with when than what we should be doing in the meantime. And that's what the Lord is referencing in verse 15 when he says, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to the nations. And then the end will come. In other words, our business is to keep sharing the good news of God's love in Christ. Not asking when, when, when. But instead understanding that because that end time, that time of judgment is coming, because eternity is so close, our mission, our calling is to share the good news of God's love and grace with those around us. Jesus steers us away from making the, main, the when question our main question. Let me ask you this morning, or this evening, or this afternoon, what are you focused on in these days? Are you focused on these trials and tribulations? Are they allowing you, are they tempting you to become increasingly alarmed by them? Sharing the good news or endlessly scrolling the bad news in a vain effort to pinpoint a schedule of judgment that's supervised by God. The business of believers in the end times is the good news, not the evening news. Your love for God, to put this another way, friends, which is the most important thing in your life, depends on you remembering how much He loves you and how much He loves other people. Your love for God depends on it. It depends on you not being distracted by asking the wrong questions. You know, when I was in the Marines, we had lots of leaders come and go, platoon lieutenants, company commanders. Most of them were more concerned about themselves than anything else. And we could tell, we knew it. They were advancing their careers. They were, uh, you know, developing themselves. They were, they were more focused on themselves. Well, none of us will forget one new lieutenant that we got at one point in this journey. And it was evident from the day he arrived that he was all about us and our welfare. That he loved us, that he cared for us, that we weren't just a bunch of faceless uniforms that he commanded, but, but we were people that meant much to him. And the consequence of his arrival was that our morale and our enthusiasm went through the roof because we knew that our leader loved us. You and me need to know this about our Father God and constantly asking the wrong question will distract us from it. In verses 15 to 35, to be sure, friends, a subject for another time, Jesus is going to talk about some of the specifics they had asked about. But before he does that, he talks about our attitude towards the issue. And he ends by strongly reminding us that when isn't the point. Again, verse 36. No one knows about the day or the hour, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Yeah. You know, over in Luke 18, which is where we're going to finish in just a couple of moments, Jesus tells a story about this same challenge that we face. In Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 1, the Lord said, uh, the, the Bible says that Jesus told the disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. And here was the parable. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea. And her plea was, grant me justice against my adversary. 
That's the cry of our time. That's what we're hearing constantly these days. Lots of people feel like her in this season. Grant us justice, Lord. And in Jesus' story, verse 4, he said, For some time the judge refused. What an agony that is to live in a hunger for justice and to not yet experience it, to not see it given. In Jesus' story, he goes on to say, but finally, this judge said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. In other words, here's what the Lord was saying. Even the bad guys can't stand in the way of justice in the end. It's coming. It's coming because the people God loves are crying out for it. It's inevitable. He will answer that prayer. Sometimes we get so focused on the unjust judges that we forget they're only human beings in a story much bigger than they think they are. Name for me one tyrant who endured. There aren't any. In the end, justice wins out. And Jesus' point is, if that's the attitude of an unjust judge, imagine how much more we can rest in God's assurance, the ultimate just judge, that justice will come. God is working out His plan on a much bigger canvas than we see. Jesus goes on to finish his story by saying this, And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out day and night? Will he keep putting them off? No, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, and, and he ends with this poignant question. He says, However, when the Son of Man comes, he will. When he comes, Will he find faith on the earth? Let me help you understand where that question comes from. Like a good father, he wants to know that we trust him, that we are confident in who he is. That's the key to our love not growing cold. That's the key to our not being deceived by all the nonsense perpetrated by false prophets with crazy ideas in a season such as this. It's knowing God's love for us. We need to know this, church. We need it so that our love for God and our love for one another doesn't get lost in the nonsense. Instead of asking, Lord, is this the time? Are you coming now? Jesus says, no, remember. Remember what's much more important, and that is the mission I've given you to share the good news of my love and grace with the world around you. You know, one of my favorite stories, one of the favorite stories of, of being a dad for me, uh, I've shared it before, some of you will be familiar with it, but Isaiah was about five, six years old, and I often had to leave town on business. We lived in Idaho, but our, our, our network headquarters in the Assemblies of God was in Seattle, and I'd often have to travel to Seattle for meetings. And, Often it would just be an overnight thing, drive over one day, have meetings, drive back the next. And one time Isaiah said, Dad, can I go with you? I want to come. I just wanted to be with his dad. I said, sure, son, let's plan that. You can come over, stay with me in the hotel. It'll be awesome. You know, we'll have a great time. So, you know, he got in the truck and, and we headed out that afternoon after work and headed for Seattle. And as we were coming over Snoqualmie Pass in the dark, Isaiah's sitting over there to the right of me in the, and he's playing with his video game, you know, and, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he stops, puts down his video game and he looks at me and he says, Dad, do we have enough gas? Now, he had never asked that question before. He didn't even know what he was talking about. But he was anxious. Dad, do we have enough gas? I looked at him like, are you kidding? I said, yeah, son, we got enough gas, no worries. You know. He goes back to playing with his little video game for a couple of minutes, and, and then he puts it down again, and with even greater urgency, he says, Dad, are you sure we have enough gas? You know, part of me wanted to laugh out loud. He, he knows nothing about that, those kinds of things. He's too little. But somewhere he had heard that people run out of gas, and somehow he'd pulled that down into this moment. And, and suddenly I understood that he didn't need to know a fact. He needed to remember who I am, his dad. 
And so I put my hand over on him and I looked him right in the eye and I said, son, I got this. You can trust me. We got enough gas. We'll get there. It'll be fine. And as our eyes locked, something clicked in him. He went back to his video game, <laughs> never worried about it for, for a moment after that. And in that moment, God said to me, Greg, sometimes you're like that. You worry about things you know next to nothing about. And even if you knew about them, you couldn't fully understand them. He says, I want you to trust who I am, Greg. I want you to trust that I'm your dad, that I love you, that I've got this figured out. Church, that's what God wants for you in this season. That's what God, Jesus wants for his friends. That's what he wants for us. Understand that that's his message to the disciples. As you feel that impulse to ask, when, 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 remember that, okay, he's going to teach a little about that. He did in verses 15 through 35, but his point is, that's not the point. The point isn't when. The point is who he is and trusting who he is. Only then will your love stay warm and strong. Only then can your unity with your fellow believers, your brothers and sisters in Christ, overcome the turmoil of this time. And that's what God desires for us. Now listen, before we close, I want to speak to those of us who are listening and who don't know Jesus as their Savior, who don't know God as their Father. Experiencing what I'm talking about is impossible for you until you receive God as your Father. And the gospel is that that's exactly who he wants to become to you. The Bible says to as many as received Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. He wants to adopt you and teach you to know him as your father. That happens when you receive his son as your savior. You can do that right now. Maybe, you know, you're looking around at what's going on in the world and you're afraid and anxious and alarmed. Kind of like Isaiah was in that truck in the middle of the night on Snoqualmie Pass. God wants you to understand how you can rest in him in this season. And it happens when you let God, you receive God as your father. So can I invite you just to bow your head with me and close your eyes in this moment? If that's you and you've never received Jesus as your savior, and so you don't know God as your father, in this moment, he wants to become your dad. When you receive Jesus as your savior, that's what happens. God adopts you. That was Jesus's message. That's the message of the Bible, the church, the Holy Spirit. And that can happen for you in this moment. You simply say to the God who's always been listening to your heart, God, I need to know you as my father. I confess that I'm a sinner, that I've done wrong. I ask your forgiveness and I ask that you make me your daughter, your son. And the moment you say that, your creator hears you and he owns you. And you are literally from the inside out born again. That can be real for you right now. Go ahead, he's listening. And for those of us who are his sons and daughters, like, like Isaiah that night in my pickup, he, he wants to capture your attention in this season and remind you of who he is and invite you to trust that more than how much you grasp the when and the how. Because then your love stays warm and strong. God, we thank you for your word this morning. Jesus, we thank you for so patiently teaching your disciples and teaching us in this moment how to know peace, how to find that strong love that overcomes these seasons. Lord, we thank you for teaching us. And we pray that as we go from this moment, Lord, it would be resting <laughs> in the fact that our Father says we have enough gas to get there. We pray for that this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you joined us. Boy, let me just encourage you to make it your regular discipline one day in seven to gather with the people of God and to hear his word. That's the way home. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. Have a great week.